Hi, this is Gordon Parker from Michigan Tech, and in this video I'm going to go through the rules for sketching a root locus. The way we'll do this is just run through um, several of the steps that are all written out, and then see how they relate to a completed root locus plot. And then we'll do a simple example that highlights a few of the steps. There'll be other videos subsequent to this one that go over all of these steps. But for now, we'll just take it easy. So, step number one. First, we have to obtain the loop transfer function. And I've shown how to do that in some other videos, uh, and we'll see that again in the brief example at the end of this one. But the important thing to do after you get the loop transfer function is note the number of poles and the number of zeros as n and m, respectively. We'll need that later. And then what you need to do is think about where are the k equals zero and k equal infinity points. Those are the points in the root locus when the design parameter k is either equal to zero or infinity. And of course the root locus is all possible closed loop pole locations for all possible values of k positive. So the k equals zero points on the root locus are just the poles of the loop transfer function and the k equal infinity points are the zeros of the loop transfer function. And we denote those in the normal way with x's and o's. Now finally we get to the first sketching rule. So you can determine where the root locus is on the real axis just by counting up the poles and zeros that are on the real axis. And so what you do is, is divide the real axis up into pieces, and I'll just draw a little sketch here with a couple um, poles and zeros, and now we know that these are k equals zero points, and these are k equal inf k equals zero points, and this is a k equal infinity point. And what we want to do is is figure out where the root locus is on the real axis. So what you do is you break the real axis now up into pieces divided up by these poles and zeros. So I have a a component here, a segment of the real axis, another segment here, another segment there, and another segment there. And now what you do to analyze if you have root locus on this segment is you look to the right of that segment and you count up the poles and zeros to the right of it. If that's an odd number, then you have root locus there. So if I count up the poles and zeros to the right of that segment, I have zero. That's an even number, so there's no root locus. For this segment, I look to the right of that segment and I see this pole. That's an odd number, one. So I do have root locus there. And I'll just put some little hash marks. For this segment, I look to the right of it. I have two things. I have a, a zero and a pole, so there's no root locus. On this segment, I look to the right. I have three things, so I know there's root locus. It's that simple. Done. Now, the asymptotes. Those are lines in the complex plane that the root locus converges to as k goes to infinity. And there'll be n minus m of those. This is the number of poles of the loop transfer function and the number of zeros. So in this case, where I have two poles and one zero, I'll have one asymptote. Whenever you have one asymptote, by the way, it's going to be the real axis. But we have, we'll have some other uh, variations of that, and they are described by this. This is the angle that the asymptote makes with the real axis. We call it theta k. So if we have one, in this case, one asymptote, we would let k go from 0 up to n minus m minus 1. Well, that's 0. So actually, I just have k equals 0. And if I plug that into here, I'll get 0 plus 1, which is pi, over 1. So my asymptote is pi. And that angle is referenced to this reference line. And it goes this way. So now I know I just have a asymptote at an angle of pi, which is 180 degrees, and that is the real axis. That's a pretty boring one. But as you'll notice, that these are just always standard angles. So for instance, if k equals 1, that is, I have n minus m is equal to 2, 
Then I'll have a 2 times 1 plus 1, so I would have 3, 3 pi over 2. Well, that's a 90 degree asymptote. So whenever I have the situation where k equals 1, or n minus m is equal to 2, I'll have two asymptotes, one at 90 degrees and one at 270 degrees. When I have n minus m equals 3, then I'll get asymptotes that look like this. Each one separated by 120 degrees. We'll experience that in some later examples, but the point is, is that the asymptote angles are a standard set of angles. Now the only other thing we need to do in terms of sorting out the asymptote issue is to find where they intersect the real axis. Now when the asymptote is equal to 180 degrees, the, it, there is no unique intersection point with the real axis. But if I had the case where I had a plus 90 degree asymptote and a minus or 270 degree asymptote like so, then there will be some point on the real axis where they intersect. And the way to determine that point, sigma, is you form this quantity. So this funny coefficient b subscript m minus 1 and this funny coefficient a subscript n minus 1 divided by the difference of poles and zeros of your loop transfer function. These coefficients just come from the characteristic equation. So if you write your characteristic equation in this form, where you have all the quantities that don't depend on k here, and all the terms that do depend on k over here, then b subscript m minus 1, this, is this term. It's the coefficient of the second highest power in s in that characteristic equation multiplied by k. A n minus 1 is this term, that coefficient, and it is the coefficient again of the second highest power of s in all the stuff that doesn't have k in it. Note that you have to make sure that this piece is written in this form where the coefficient of s to the m is equal to 1. For example, if I had a characteristic equation that looked like this, s cubed plus 2s squared plus 5s plus 3 equals k, 4s plus 8, then what I need to do is bring that 4 outside. So I would do this. Bring the 4 outside, and now I have s plus 2. Now I can figure out the sigma point. Sigma is equal to this coefficient, 2, minus, and what do you know? I have the same quantity here, that 2, divided by n minus m. Well, my n in this case is 3, and my m is equal to 1, so I have 2. Boy, I have a lot of 2's in this example. But it really doesn't matter, because it just says that my sigma point is equal to 0. That would be right there at the origin of the complex plane. Angles of departure. Well, let me draw a picture to illustrate how this works. Let's say that we have k equals 0 points in the complex plane, and perhaps we have a k equal infinity point out here, a 0 of the loop transfer function. Now, based on what we saw earlier, we know that we have root locus on this part of the real axis. Because when I look to the right of that segment, I have 1, 0 on the real axis, and that's an odd number, so I have root locus there. Now, I know that these are k equals 0 points, and I know this is a k equal infinity point. So somehow, my root locus has to leave this point k equals 0 point and, and get to the real axis. Well, that means that it's going to do something perhaps like this. right? It's going to leave that k equals 0 point and get to the real axis. But does it go like that? Or does it go like this? And what happens here might be very important for your control system design. Now, here's what an angle of departure is. It's the angle that the root locus departs from that k equals zero point. 
Now similarly, if we had zeros in the complex plane, then we would have branches of the root locus arriving at those zeros, those k equal infinity points. The angle that the root locus segment makes when it arrives to that k equal infinity point is the arrival angle. And we'll see how to do those in a subsequent video. Now here's another piece of information, the intersection of the root locus with the imaginary axis. Well this doesn't always happen, but it does happen if you have a root locus that has a branch or maybe two or maybe three that cross the imaginary axis and goes into the right half plane. Whenever that happens we'll have an intersection with the imaginary axis. Well that's a stability question. So all we have to do to analyze what the value of k is and what the actual point is on the imaginary axis is to do a Routh array. And specifically what we do is we find values of k that lead to an auxiliary equation. Because we know when we have an auxiliary equation we have the possibility of having poles on the imaginary axis. So then we analyze the auxiliary equation and see if we can actually make that happen. Breakaway points. Well, let's take a look at that. Let's see we have this case. k equals zero point, k equals zero point, and a k equals zero point. What we know is that we'll have root locus here and here. If these are k equals zero points, and I have to figure out how the branches of the root locus leave those k equals zero points, there's only one option for these two k equals zero points. They have to be headed to or towards each other. When that happens, eventually those two branches are going to run into each other and pop off into the complex plane. The point on the real axis right here where that occurs is called a breakaway point. And the way that we calculate the breakaway points is by just taking the derivative of the loop transfer function with respect to s and then finding all values of s that satisfy this equation. And those will be candidate breakaway points. And then we have to check to see if they make any sense in terms of what we know about the root locus. So for instance, if solving this equation tells you that a breakaway point is here, then you know that's nonsense. You have to pick the solutions that make sense. Finally, with all this information in 1 through 8, we use what we have and attempt a sketch at the root locus. Now, having said all that, let's take a look at a rather rich example. So let me darken in a few of these. There's k equals zero points here, 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 and here. And whenever you make a root locus, you always want to label these. k equals zero, k equals zero, k equals zero. And then there's a k equal infinity point here and here. And there's also another k equals zero point right there. So now I've labeled all those. And of course the root locus is, is already done for us. But we can see a lot of interesting things here. This would be that sigma point. It's the point where these asymptotes intersect the real axis. There's two asymptotes there. There's another asymptote if we were to calculate those theta k's. That's actually the real axis. Again, those asymptotes are lines in the complex plane that the root locus converges to as k goes to infinity. And sure enough, as k goes to infinity, we have a branch of the root locus here that is heading off like so. So way out here is a k equal infinity point. Just like out here, there's a k equal infinity and a k equal infinity. Let's see, we also have a breakaway point here. It's actually, I suppose a better term for it would be a break-in point because what happens is the root locus leaves these k equals zero points and then runs into the real axis and branches off towards that k equal infinity point here and of course off to infinity in the real axis. 
let's see, we also have some nice um, angles of departure. Here's one. Um, here's a k equals zero point, and the root locus leaves that k equals zero point like this. So the angle of departure looks like, oh, maybe 110 degrees or so, measured from this horizontal point. So the example that we're going to look at is one where the loop transfer function is equal to 1 over s, s plus 3. Now this root locus we could do without using sketching rules and so on. We could just calculate uh, exactly where the poles of the closed loop transfer function are. But what we'll do is, is we'll go through some of those rules, then we'll use a couple extra tips to help us make that sketch. And here, the, here they are. First off, we know that segments of the root locus are always going to leave poles and arrive at zero, because these are k equals zero points, and these are k equal infinity points. The number of zeros at infinity is n minus m. What that means is, if we go back a slide, these type of k equal infinity points at the ends of the asymptotes. Now we also know, and we saw from that previous figure, that if you have a segment of the root locus between two poles, then there will be a breakaway point between those two poles. And then finally, the root locus is always symmetric about the real axis. So really we only have to do half of a root locus and we get the other half for free. Here's our example. That's actually a one. And we can make our loop transfer function. GL of S is equal to one over S, S plus three. Well, what should we do with this? Let's start plotting this up. We notice that N is equal to 2, M is equal to 0, the number of poles, the number of zeros. So let's look at the real axis first. If I go down a slide, we have some nice little uh, plot already made for us. So here's a k equals 0 point, and the other k equals 0 point is right here. Now, let's look at the root locus on the real axis. We look at this segment. Look to the right of it. There's no poles or zeros. There's no root locus. Look at this segment. Look to the right of it. We have one pole, so we have root locus there. And so I'll just draw a little hash mark, like so. And then we look at this segment. Look to the right of it. There's two poles, no root locus. Great, so we have root locus between those two k equals zero points, so I know I'm going to have a breakaway point. So I might as well calculate it. So dgl ds equals zero, and we'll solve this for values of s, where gl is one over s, s plus three. So let's go ahead and do that. dgl ds is equal to, if I use that quotient rule, I would have zero minus derivative of the bottom, the denominator, so that'd be 2s plus 3, divided by the bottom squared. But I really don't care about that because I'm going to set this equal to 0. So what I see from this is that 2s is equal to negative 3, and s is equal to negative 3 halves. That's the breakaway point. So let's sketch that onto the root locus. Negative 3 halves, that's 1 and a half, and it's right there. Now let's go ahead and do some asymptotes. n was equal to 2, and m was equal to 0. So let's look at the angles for the asymptotes. We had an equation on the previous uh, set of notes that looked like this. And we'll take k from 0 all the way up to n minus m minus 1. So let's see, n minus m is 2, minus 1 is 1, so we're going to cycle k from 0 and 1. So theta 0 is equal to 2 times k, that's 0, so we have pi over 2. And theta 1, let k equal 1, 
you get 3, 3 pi over 2. So this is the case where we have 90 and 270 degrees. Now the only other thing we have to find is the point where those asymptotes intersect the real axis. And to do that, we write the characteristic equation. So we had this for the loop transfer function. And we know our characteristic equation is equal to 1 plus kg loop. And that's equal to 0. So f is equal to s, s plus 3, plus k. And I'll just write this out a little bit more. Now what we have to do is identify the coefficients of the second highest power in s in this piece and this piece. Well here it's pretty easy, it's 3. But here it's a little trickier because there is no second highest power of s. Well, that's not so tricky I guess, it's 0. So now we calculate that sigma point, it will be 0, this quantity, minus that, so 3, over n minus m. So look at that, we have negative 3 halves again. Now that was the same point that we had for the breakaway point, but it's also our asymptote intersection point. That means that our asymptotes go right through that breakaway point. Now let's calculate if we have any imaginary axis crossings. Well, let's see. To do that, we'll use this characteristic equation and see what we can do with the Routh array. So we have s squared plus 3s plus k. And let's just do it. So we had s squared plus 3s plus k. So it would look like this. This term then would be 3k minus 0 over 3, so it would be k. And what we try to do is find a value of k that gives us an auxiliary equation. Well, there is none. What we'd be hoping to find is that there's a value of k that makes this row all 0, and then this would be the auxiliary equation. But there is none. So we can conclude from this that there is no imaginary axis crossing. we now have all the information we can possibly get to make our root locus. I'll switch colors. So now what we know is the root locus leaves these k equals zero points, cruises along the real axis to this breakaway point, which is actually the asymptote. So it, the root locus segments don't converge to this. They actually lie right on top of it. And there it is. I now know all possible closed loop pole locations for all possible values of k. Now if I had a design where I said I want to have my closed loop poles here, then I would just pick off that value of s. We'll call it negative uh, 1.5 plus 1.5j. And then I would form k by knowing this, that the magnitude of g of l evaluated at this point is equal to 1 over k. So I just take that transfer function, the loop transfer function, plug in this value of s, take its magnitude, invert it, and boom, I've got k. What this plot also tells me is that if I needed to have closed loop poles here and here, there's no way it's going to happen. I would have to change my compensator form in order to make the root locus bend through that point. And we'll see how to do that also in a subsequent video. So just to summarize, we went through the rules of how to sketch a root locus. And there's a lot of them. And we correlated those rules to a completed root locus plot. And then we did a very simple root locus just to illustrate a few of the rules. Then you can look at another video to see more complicated root locus examples. So again, this is Gordon Parker from Michigan Tech, and thanks for watching.